Welcome, everybody, to The Christian Marauder. I have a very special guest here in the studio today, Derek Gilbert. Welcome back, Derek. It's an honor to be here, Brian. Thank you for having me. Yes, Derek Gilbert is a host of Skywatch TV and you know, Unraveling Revelations and a host of other things. He also wrote a book, The Second Coming of Saturn. This is the book I'd like to talk about because it is an eye-opening book. It has a lot of stuff and information here. And some of it is groundbreaking and what you call earth-shattering as too, especially <laughs> when regarding who the angel in the tree of knowledge was, the fallen angel in that tree of knowledge. But Derek put it together really well with that. Why don't you give a summary of the book of the second coming of Saturn? And also we can talk about the planetary alignment that happened just a few days ago, still going on right now. How all that fits in with this weird topic of fallen watchers and the coming of Saturn. Well, the uh, in the ancient world, fallen angels who rebelled against the authority of God convinced our, our distant ancestors, that uh, they were, in fact, those lights in the sky. So the uh, planet, planets visible to the naked eye, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, were um, believed to be those entities. And in fact, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, we see the uh, the word stars used to represent the angels of God, uh, the Malachim, or messenger angels, the host of heaven, uh, the army of heaven is really what that means. And uh, so when we see references to stars in the Bible, we need to look at the context because very often it refers to those those spirit beings, those supernatural entities who uh, God created and um, like us created with free will. And like us, many of them decided to uh, reject his authority. The, um, the entity known as Saturn, just in a nutshell, if they're like an elevator pitch for the book, I believe has uh, been ignored for the most part throughout uh, history, at least his backstory. Um, the Romans and the Greeks had a very specific uh, belief about him that uh, he overthrew the sky god, was the ruler of the cosmos for a while, and then in turn was overthrown by his son, the storm god. In Greece, that would be Zeus. In Rome, that would be Jupiter. But when you trace the story back, you see that this goes back to the very early, earliest civilizations, the earliest literate civilizations on Earth, Mesopotamia, and uh, to the north, the Hurrians and the Hittites. They had the same story, where the sky god Anu was overthrown by Enlil, his son, who in turn was overthrown, or replaced anyway, by Marduk, who if not a storm god directly, at least had storm god attributes. But uh, it's the it's the same story told over and over, but it is the fake news version of what really happened in history. What really happened is what we read in the Bible, and by extension what we get uh, from the parts of the Bible supported by some of the narrative in the book of First Enoch. The uh, rebellious sons of God, called Watchers in First Enoch, hatched a, a plot and uh, through mutual oaths uh, sworn to one another on the summit of Mount Hermon, came down, intermingled with humanity, and created a monstrous race of giant beings called the Nephilim, half human, half divine. God found it necessary to destroy them in the flood, and according to Enoch, those entities, the spirits of those entities, because they were neither fully divine nor fully human, were barred entry to the usual places spirits go in the spirit realm, they, did, they were denied entrance to Hades or Sheol in the Hebrew mind. They were not allowed into the throne room of God, his presence. So they were condemned to wander the earth, tormenting humanity until the final judgment, which is what we New Testament Christians would call Armageddon. So who is this, this entity who led this rebellion? In the book of First Enoch, he's called Shemiyaza. And I put together the clues and make a case that... The entity known to the Romans as Saturn, the patron god of the most popular annual festival in the Roman calendar, Saturnalia, was, in fact, Shemiyaza of the ancient Hebrews. I was reading your book, and one thing that really fascinated me was how everyone, you know, you read the Genesis account, the Genesis chapter uh, 3 account, the serpents in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and Everyone has an idea who that might be. Why don't you kind of enlighten us and what your findings were on that? Well, yeah. Um, in Genesis 3, we get the uh, the story of the uh, the serpent in the garden, the Nakash. And most of us have been taught in, uh, in, in uh, church when we get pastors who teach on Satan at all, that uh, Satan, the uh, 
tempter in the garden is uh, one and the same as the entity who is described in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. These are parallel chapters. Scholars agree on that. They describe an entity who rebelled against God and for his sin was tossed out of Eden. Ezekiel 28 says he was thrown off the mountain of God. Uh, Eden is a garden, but it's also a mountain. And that's significant because this whole war is about control of the mount of assembly. In Hebrew, that's har moed, which is the Hebrew phrase behind the term in Revelation 19, Armageddon. That's what this whole war is about. But when you read Isaiah 14 uh, carefully, and Ezekiel 28 carefully, and Isaiah 14 is the, is the chapter that most of us uh, have at least heard of, because that's where we get the, the word or the name Lucifer, um, you see that there's really nothing in either of those chapters that connects that entity to what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Um, And in fact, when you start digging into the Hebrew, you realize that Lucifer is not really a proper name, at least not, that's not the original proper name. In the Hebrew, it's Helel ben Shachar, which means um, day star, son of dawn, or light bringer, son of dawn. At least that's how Jerome, who translated the Hebrew into, or translated the Hebrew, or the Greek rather, because he was working from the Septuagint, uh, 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 Heosphoros was what uh, it was in the Greek, uh, which essentially means light bringer. And so Jerome called him Lux and Pharos, meaning light and carrier. And from there we get Lucifer. And so we assume that this is the entity's name, Lucifer. Well, it's not. It's Helel ben Shakar. Um, so who is this if he's not Satan? I mean, there are other clues here. Uh, for example, the Old Testament concept of Satan. There's really nothing in the other references to Satan in the Old Testament that connect him to um, the underworld or to the Rephaim, which are the spirits of the Nephilim destroyed in the flood. In other words, the Rephaim are demons. Um, there is nothing in either. Uh, there's there's only a few mentions of, of Satan in the Old Testament, and we need to understand that Satan it is is likewise not a proper name it is a title the the uh, uh the definite article the in hebrew it's ha is uh, mm-hmm. always present every time you see this mention like in job chapters 1 and 2 in zechariah chapter 4 where he uh, uh is is confronting and accusing the high priest in the days of zechariah it's ha satan the satan and interestingly enough and i only learned this a couple of months ago i should have known this when i wrote the book it's um also present in Greek. The Greek definite article is ho, ho satanus. It's the Satan, which, well, I could rabbit trail there, but I won't. The, the, but the point is this, that there's nothing in the Old Testament character of Satan in the couple of references that we have to him that connects him to the netherworld, as in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where he's cast down and the Rephaim rise up to greet him and say, you are as weak as we, but now uh, worms will be your bed and maggots your covering or or some such thing. Um, This is not the character of the Satan, the adversary, which is what that word means, the adversary, the accuser. And uh, in fact, Jews in the days of Jesus, which would include, you know, the apostles, they did not have that concept of Satan as the Lord of hell, that we Christians have today. This is a tradition that developed over the centuries, really between the 2nd century and the 5th century A.D. In fact, the presentation I uh, prepared for Skywatch TV's virtual conference, which begins on May 13th, is really, it's all about this topic and how uh, we uh, sort of created Satan. Uh, A friend of ours by the name of David W. Lowe wrote a book about 15 years ago called uh, uh, Deconstructing Lucifer. And at the time, I thought he was nuts because he argued what I'm suggesting here and what I put into the book, The Second Coming of Saturn, that Lucifer is not Satan. It is this other character called Shemiaza by the ancient Hebrews, Saturn by the Romans, and by another name in uh, Revelation chapter 9. Uh, one other question that always bothered me, and it never really dawned on me until I was willing to entertain the idea that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 was referring to a different supernatural character other than Satan. Satan is described in Genesis 3, and I'm okay with the idea that that is the same Satan that we see in Revelation 12 and Revelation 19, you know, leader of the rebellion against God in the end times. Uh, Okay, that's the same entity. I'm okay with that. He is described in Revelation as a seven-headed dragon in, uh, you know, that ancient serpent in, in in, in, in Genesis 3. He's called the Nakash, the serpent. So if he's a serpent, then how in Ezekiel 28 can he be described as the guardian cherub 
who covers, who presumably covers the, the throne of God, one of the uh, guardians of the throne of God. How can he be cherub and be a serpent at the same time? Because the cherubim are described very specifically by Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. He, the cherubim look like those big winged bull creatures from outside the palace of the Assyrian kings in Nineveh. Looks like a giant um, bull-like sphinx, with, but with four faces. Human, eagle, ox, and uh, lion. And so the, the, there's no way, in my mind, you, you, how, how can he be the same? Th- well, it's because he's not the same character. You're dealing with a different rebellious angel. And we know from Revelation chapter 12, when Satan is tossed out of heaven by Michael, whether that's a past event or a future event, and he takes a third of the stars with him, a third of the angels with him, there are other rebellious supernatural entities. So we know that there are other rebellious uh, angels who uh, decided to reject God's authority. So why do we assume Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are the same character as Genesis 3 when the description of those characters you're the guardian cherub. Oh, you're a Nakash. You're a serpent. You're a human lion, ox, eagle thing. You know, they're different characters. And I argue that this is the character. This uh, character in Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, is Shemiyaza, Kronos to the Greeks, Saturn to the Romans. And uh, again, another, another name that he has used for him in Revelation chapter 9. I was looking up some stuff here, and this always puzzled me. Maybe you can help me. I was looking at some of the, the um, old uh, astrological um, signs. They call Satan, I call Satan, Ha, Ha, Satan. I already know that, but it's the Satan, or capital Satan. Satan should be spelled in all in caps, whatever you want to do in the Hebrew to emphasize that. And so I call him the big Satan. And so he is in, in Revelation, he has a tail. He throws his stars, his servants, to the earth first. So I always find that quite fascinating. And also found another thing is that Draco always goes back to the constellation Draco, meaning the dragon. And I think he was a northernest star on the constellation Draco. And I always thought that was interesting. You have somebody in heaven throwing all of these entities here on earth. And that's kind of what I, when I was studying the old God stuff, that's what I was finding. All these characters, I found I'm the top seven or the top four, which we're talking about one, about, <laughs> about Enlil, and things just didn't quite fit. So I never really had brave enough like you were to say, well, Lucifer probably isn't uh, who we think it is. Well, what's really interesting, too, is that when you go back in, in time, because of the uh, uh, a wobble in the Earth's rotation, uh, what they call procession over the years, like, what is it, 26,000 years as it makes kind of a circle in the sky, like a top that's slightly off balance. The um, North Star, Polaris, has not always been the North Star. When you go back 5,000 years to the time of Abraham, the North Star was Alpha Draconis. Yep, and the dragon. (laughs) Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. And I was just thinking about this mysterious Enlil and uh, Saturn creature that everyone talks about. Mm-hmm. We had just not too long ago, I think 2016 on up to uh, the year 2020, um, they always talking about Saturn and they had this cube and they showed these commercials with all this stuff and, and this age of Saturn. Could you kind of illuminate us on the age of Saturn and what that means? Well, it's... Um... It's really the age of Aquarius is uh, yeah. what what we entered on, and that's kind of what inspired the book. I've been collecting information and research on this this character, as uh, Sharon and I have researched our other recent books, like Last Clash of the Titans. Obviously, when you're talking about the Titans, you know, Kronos was the king of the Titans, so I've had to put information about him in that book, and that's where I discovered that the uh, ancient Hittites. And before them, the Hurrians, those are people who occupied northern Mesopotamia, what is now Turkey and northern, the the Kurdish regions of northern Syria and Iraq. They knew who this character was. They called him Kumarbi. So I I had this this information set aside and uh, didn't realize that at the same time that entity was identical to, uh, in ancient texts, you know, God bless the ancient scribes who would put together these uh, god lists 
to, uh, you know, sort of like Google Translate, but on clay tablets where they would put the name of the gods of one culture. And then, okay, in Akkad, you know, the Akkadians called them this, but the Amorites who live along the Euphrates River call them this, and the Canaanites who live over here call them this. And Enlil is the same as Saturn, Kronos, Baal Hamon, Dagon, who was previously called Dagan by the uh, Amorites and along the Euphrates River, um, Milcom by the Ammonites, El by the Canaanites, uh, the same character, just going by different names and occupying the same slot in the pantheon, the one who was formerly the king, but he's been replaced by the storm god, Baal, Marduk, Teshub, Tarhunt, Zeus, Jupiter, etc., etc. Uh, you can even go to the uh, Norse pantheon and, you know, Thor and Odin. It's interesting that this character shows up so often in, in the Bible uh, under under a variety of names. And, and so finally, when we were coming up in uh, toward the end of 2020, which is when I began writing the book, should probably have started sooner to release it right at the same time as the the great conjunction that took place at the end of 2020, that uh, the, the, the planets representing the um, current king of the pagan pantheon, if you will, Jupiter, and the former king, Saturn, had a uh, a meeting in the sky on the winter solstice of 2020, which of course is a date that's very important in pagan uh, the pagan calendar. Um, you know, the winter solstice of 2012, we were supposed to see the Mayan apocalypse. It's possible it it happened, just not the way we think, because society has changed over the last 10 years a lot faster than any any of us thought it was possible. But on December 21st of uh, 2020, this great conjunction in the night sky, you had uh, Saturn and Jupiter meeting at uh, zero degrees of the constellation Aquarius. Now, this was the closest uh, visible conjunction of these two planets since the year 1226. It was uh, the the most recent one since, uh, I think, the early 17th century when um, Johannes Kepler, the famous astronomer, speculated that perhaps this uh, was what uh, the, the wise men saw you know, the, uh, the the Christmas star that led them to Bethlehem. Well, you know, sorry to break it to you, Mr. Kepler. Uh, he was brilliant, but he was wrong about this because that star uh, rose in the east, according to the Bible. And so if they were coming from the east and the star rose in the east, they would have been going in the wrong direction. There was something else. Anyway, Jupiter and Saturn representing the current uh, king of the pantheon, Saturn representing the former king of the pantheon, meeting at zero degrees of the constellation Aquarius, According to astrologers, this represents something that they call the great mutation, not conjunction, the great mutation, sort of like Jupiter handing the baton back to old dad, who he deposed and threw down to Tartarus, Jupiter giving it back to Saturn, which means we are now fully into the age of Aquarius, 50 years after the fifth dimension sang that famous song, we are now fully in the age of Aquarius, which is supposed to be an age where we will be less materialistic, Power will be decentralized, and uh, it's sort of like the Great Reset. You know, we will own nothing and we'll we'll be happy about it. Uh, that, I think, is what the occultists, the occult adepts and astrologers are looking at. And that's why it was all over the news, in my view, uh, toward the end of 2020. The Christmas star is coming. The Christmas star is coming. Mm-hmm. It was not the Christmas star. And as Christians, Brian, I know you and I reject the idea that our fortunes and our fates are dictated by the movement of the planets in the night sky. But there are very important people, very powerful people who do believe that. I mean, remember the most powerful man in the free world in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan, his wife set his calendar based on advice from her personal astrologer. So this is not as weird as some people might like to think. This is very important. So this book is just to say, hey, look, this is what some out there think is about to happen the time is now to push the great reset because the signs are right the stars have aligned saturn is now the ruling planet in traditional astrology the ruling planet of the house of aquarius which we have now fully entered on the winter solstice of 2020 so that's where the book begins and then I trace the character of this entity from ancient prehistoric times through the present day, even modern cults of Saturn, and then uh, how they think this may this may play out. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, when you talk about the age of, of Aquarius, when I was studying it, and the age of Saturn coming up on this, um, it's about a gelling and a blending together 
and homogeny and uh it's it's really bizarre but they want to make everything harmonious and so you have the male meets the female and they join together and so we're seeing a very last you know 10 12 years a force to demasculinize men and exalt women to create this world of balance and then you have all the stuff that's going on with disney and it, it's it's very obvious to me what's going on because i'm watching i'll say at the world economic forum watching their videos mm-hmm. and doing something i'm going wow i think they're into astrology they're they're, they're gung-ho for this stuff and they're pushing this stuff um putting this, this new world order stuff this new blend you own nothing you'll be happy about it everybody will be blended together and harmonious and the and they will take care of you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in order to get there they want to create as much chaos the the female side and blend it with the male and finally the yin and yang all become what gray <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, th- I think there there's some interesting speculation that we can we can do there. Sharon has argued, and I think very convincingly, that the uh, spirit of the age is uh, the ancient Mesopotamian goddess Inanna, except that Inanna was herself gender fluid. There are ancient Sumerian hymns that have been found that uh, praise her for being able to change men into women and vice versa. And uh, some of her temple servants, uh, when you translate the t- their title, the job title from Sumerian into English, we couldn't really repeat it on this program, but that's because it speaks to the type of sexual deviancy that she uh, uh, she propagated, and that is where we are today. Uh, Sharon has also argued, and I think correctly, that Inanna, this uh, spirit no, also known as Ishtar, Astarte in the Bible, Venus, Aphrodite, the Queen of Heaven, um, is uh, thinks that she is going to be in charge when uh, things really break down in the end times uh, she is the uh, the the woman the scarlet woman who rides the beast in in the book of revelation but the 10 kings who serve uh, the beast and the dragon will turn on her and destroy her so um i, I think there's some some um politics going on behind the scenes in the fallen realm as well as here in the natural realm um but that makes sense. You know, it's like you got guys angling to become the next president of the United States. They may all hate the guy from the other party who's sitting in the Oval Office right now, but they all want to be the next one in that office. Uh, so uh, I think that's what's going on in the spirit realm as well. So uh, you, you've got these uh, entities looking to overthrow God and his throne to take control of his heart moed, his mount of assembly, and uh, win that final battle. But they're also fighting with each other over who's going to be the one to take his place. Yeah, what I'm finding also is all these people are trying to contact these beings mm-hmm. in the occult world, and they're actually making contact. And you wrote in here, in your other book, Veneration, as well as the uh, this one too, it's a chapter here, you wrote, Sacrifices to the Dead. And um, since I've been studying the occult world and studying the old gods and see how all this stuff fits, and then I live out here in Colorado, I go down into the desert southwest, and they have kivas, and um, and some of the newer stuff about talking to First Nations people about kivas um, was connection to ancestors, and and they used the ceremonial grounds and connection to ancestors, and I thought that was interesting. Then I read your book, I'm going, this makes a lot of sense, so... There obviously something happened to Inlil, and and I call the top four, and they were cast into Tartarus, just to make a long story short. Mm -hmm. And there are people in high positions of authority, and you know I won't say the World Economic Forum out loud, but I just did. But you know you got you got people in these, and they're they're in connection with something. They're following a template, and is worldwide phenomena and. I'm, I fully suspect, I want to do a video on this sometime, or maybe even a movie, just to show there's this connection. I keep finding it. And it's like they're connecting with these entities in some sort of ceremony. Did you find that out in your book? or? Well, we, uh, we again, Sharon and I, as you point out, have been researching this for a little while. We wrote the book Veneration because it became obvious to us that the Rephraim and the spirits of the dead, or the spirits of what uh, people believe are the dead, 
In a sense, they are. They're the spirits of the dead Nephilim destroyed in the flood. The early church understood that this was the origin of demons. This was the default belief of the church for about the first four centuries after the resurrection until Augustine came along and sort of popularized the idea that um, Genesis 6 doesn't mean what it actually says, that the plain reading of Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4 is not how we're supposed to interpret it. You know, it's the the sons of Seth and the evil daughters of Cain are who's in view there, and that's not what the early church believed at all. Um, so, yes, this practice of spirit... Uh, of venerating the, the spirits of the ancestors, which is all over the world. I mean, not just here among the First Nations, but uh, in, in Africa, in Asia. It's a big thing in Asia. Uh, you know, Chinese, uh, Koreans, Vietnamese, it's, it's a big deal there as well. So this, this is worldwide, and it all comes back to what happened at Mount Hermon with these entities. And, uh, and I should have mentioned earlier on, because you, you've mentioned this twice now, the connection between Enlil and this entity. Enlil was, again, the chief god of Mesopotamia, overthrew or replaced the sky god Anu, replaced by his son Marduk. But a scholar by the name of William R. Gallagher, uh, and this was uh, pointed out to me by our friend Dr. Doug Hamp, who uh, put this in his book, Corrupting the Image 2, uh, William R. Gallagher, back in 1994, wrote a paper called On the Identity of Halel ben Shakar of Isaiah 14. And he showed that when you translate uh, Enlil from Akkadian to West Semitic languages, in other words, Hebrew, you get Halel. So Halel is Enlil, and that it, you know, it's right there in the Bible. It's just most of us just assume, okay, well, it's Lucifer, and Lucifer is Satan, and that's all there is to it. Except it's it's not. When you dig into the Hebrew with somebody who knows what he's you know looking at, like Dr. Gallagher, uh, you, you you got the the information right there. Besides the clues, Ezekiel twenty eight. No, he's not. He's a cherubim. He's not a snake or serpent or nakash, which is a serpentine supernatural being. So that's that's who is in view here. But he led this rebellion that led to the creation of the Nephilim giants who were destroyed in the flood. And again, it's their spirits that are demons that masquerade as the ancestral spirits and this veneration was around ancient israel they were drawn into it on the plains of moab uh moses and the israelites began to worship a uh, an entity called baal peor and uh, sharon and i in our research for veneration found that the word peor you know baal just means lord peor is based on a hebrew word that means opening or ga- gap or cleft and in this context means uh, opening to the netherworld these entities uh, that they were worshiping were the spirits, demons, spirits of the dead. And that's confirmed in Psalm 106, verse 28, where uh, uh, it's, it reads that uh, God was provoked to anger by uh, the Israelites eating sacrifices. And the, uh, the sacrifices that they were offering to the god Baal Peor, uh, of course, Baal just means Lord in, in Hebrew, and Peor is based on a Semitic word or the Hebrew root meaning uh, opening. But when we go to Psalm 106, verse 28, the context shows us it's uh, opening or a gap uh, or the, the, the opening or the entrance to the netherworld because Psalm 106, verse 28 shows that uh, what, what prompted God to get angry enough to send a plague that killed 24,000 uh, Israelites, which wasn't stopped until Aaron's grandson Phineas took a spear and ran through the uh, young Israelite man and Midianite woman who were reading between the lines, apparently performing a fertility rite of some sort, uh, right in front of Moses and all Israel. And, you know, again, the, the Bible's a little delicate about that, but um, when you r- read that Phineas stabbed them both with one thrust of his spear, there are only a few physical positions they could have been in for him to do that. So, uh, but as shocking as that is, that's not what made God angry. According to the psalmist, Psalm 106, 28, it's because they were eating sacrifices offered to the dead. The Israelites had been pulled into this worship of these spirits created by the illicit union of the watchers, the sons of God from Genesis 6, and humans. And even though this happened in 1400 B.C. or thereabouts, 1406 B.C., and it was well known to the Israelites, 700 years later, Isaiah was still condemning the Israelites for engaging in these occult practices among the tombs, eating forbidden food like uh, uh, tainted broth and, uh, and pig's flesh. Why was that forbidden? In our research for the book Veneration, we found that in the uh, ancient Near East... 
Uh, pigs were not just taboo only for the Israelites. They were taboo for a number of cultures in the ancient world because they were only bred, some scholars believe, they were only bred to offer as sacrifices to the dead. And Isaiah's reference to tainted broth was a reference to the fact that, uh, and this is known from Greek and Roman uh, inscriptions that have been found, the ritual meal eaten for the near, the recently dead you know, somebody would die, they'd put him in a, in a tomb or, or whatever, a cairn. And then on the third day, they would eat this ritual meal. Interesting that that third day motif appears again and again. And we, we document that in the book Veneration. So, but the point is that the Israelites kept doing this. They kept engaging in this ritual practice. And in fact, we found in the book Veneration, in our research for Veneration, that this continued into the Christian era and that the earliest Christian churches built in Rome after Constantine legalized Christianity were built in graveyards so that Christians could continue the practice of offering ritual meals to their deceased ancestors or what they believed were their dead ancestors. St. Oh, Peter's Basilica on the Vatican grounds. St. Peter's Basilica is one of those churches built in a graveyard for that reason. Well, you go over to England or New England up here, and you have churches and there's graveyards surrounding the entire church mm-hmm. and people buried under the floor. Hmm. Well, nothing wrong with that necessarily because there's a convenience factor there. What's wrong is when yeah. you go out in the graveyard every Sunday after church and have a ritual meal and summon your ancestors by name to partake of the meal. That's that's the problem, and that's what the uh, Israelites were engaging in and the early Christian church. Yeah, and wow, wow, that, that's a mouthful right there. And when I'm just thinking about all this stuff, and man, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm looking at all this this data that you wrote in here about the veneration and the dead and stuff, and these people were actually trying to contact, I, I would call it, the, the, the ones that came sent to alter humanity in order to make the Nephilim, other words, to make a blending of two natures, the age of Aquarius, so to speak, if you're following me, and they're waiting for this age to come. And so the first age was a flop because God sent the flood. And so now you have these people trying to connect to the head honchos there in the abyss and through the eating of you know the ritual meal and stuff to the dead, in order to make contact with this thing to get their marching orders. And I'm going great shades of Alice Bailey. <laughs> what can I say other than that? But what's you know what's really tragic is that we even see this in some of the um, some of the protests. And I don't want to get too specific here because I don't want to get you canceled or anything like that. But because uh, uh, actually I did a presentation on this subject on a uh, very prominent. Um, organization that received a lot of corporate support over the last few years that was protesting uh, racial inequality. And uh, as part of their protest, they would say the name and then they would pour out a drink offering, pour out a libation. They don't realize, I don't think, that these were two of the three aspects of the ancient Amorite practice. I mean, we're talking 4,000 years ago in the time of Abraham. We know from Amorite texts that have been found in ancient Syria, ancient Iraq, ancient Lebanon, ancient Israel, that these, th- that the ritual re- required three things. Number one, saying the names of the ancestors to summon them. Number two, there was a ritual meal. That's what the uh, teraphim, the household idols, were used for. You remember that from the story of Jacob stealing the household idols from mm-hmm. his father-in-law? And number three is pouring out a drink offering. I mean, this was so important that the son, the eldest son in a family... In the ancient Amorite culture was called the pourer of water because that's how important it was. If you didn't summon your ancestors once a month on the night of no moon, the 30th day of each month in a lunar calendar and pour out, the, you know, feed them, pour out the drink offering, your ancestors would starve in the afterlife and they'd get angry and you wouldn't like dead grandpa when he's angry. So this is what's happening today in America on our streets. And in some cases, you can find these videos on YouTube happening in some of our churches today because people think oh well it's just a cultural thing this is a this is a cultural tradition that goes back to the old country it goes back to a very old country it goes back to ancient Mes- it goes back to mount hermon and this entity saturn shemiyaza yeah it goes right back i just call i use the mesopotamian names because that's what i study because i try to study them all i get so confused because <laughs> they go by so many different names the same one that's true and it's by design yeah, it's to confuse like, us yeah yeah, when I worked in the jail, I mean, I 
I was, worked in community corrections. I worked in the jail, and inmates would do that. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and you didn't know who they were talking about. Yeah, that's and, per- again by design. <laughs> by design. Hmm. <laughs> what can I say? Criminals are criminals. But these entities, you know, we, uh, the dragon threw his tail. Go back to Revelation. And he threw his cohorts to the earth first before he arrives. And so now we have the player. We have Saturn. And now Saturn is in this age where they're going to blend everything together. That's just, and you have, you see it everywhere and you can't hardly talk about Mm -hmm. it. You don't want to get canceled, but you see this blending together and it's just amazing. And I can't well, say well, anymore. I wouldn't yeah. get in trouble. <laughs> well, well, again, and and let me talk then about the the end times, and 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 uh, just to make clear, so that we're not confusing anyone, that uh, Saturn and Satan are two different entities. Uh, again, yes. Saturn, I believe, is this ancient entity called Shemiyaza, who led the rebellion at Mount Hermon. But as I was studying uh, this, I, I would I stumbled. Well, no, the Lord led me to something that I think is rather important. Um, in the time of Solomon. Okay, the son of David, Solomon built the temple of Yahweh. He built the temple on the Temple Mount, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. This was the uh, uh, the site on Mount Moriah where David purchased the uh, threshing floor of Arana to uh, stop the destroyer from destroying Jerusalem. And David had been tempted by, and interestingly, the other, First Chronicles twenty one is the other place in the Old Testament where we see uh, Satan, Satan mentioned but there the reference does not have the definite article the it's not the satan it's a satan arose to tempt david so it's not clear that this is an a supernatural uh tempter or a supernatural accuser or a supernatural adversary it might have been a political opponent it might have been somebody who was you know raising up an army uh fomenting rebellion against david so he sent out joab his general to count the number of soldiers he could depend on and for that god punished israel by sending the destroyer well in hebrew that term that word is ha mashkit the destroyer okay david lives a good long life uh puts down the rebellion of absalom uh deals with some other issues finally passes on buried uh, solomon takes over uh, has to deal with his own rebellion gets done with that he's uh, living in peace and wealth he starts accumulating foreign wives that's how you cement a treaty back in the day and these wives start uh, cajoling solomon to build temples to their gods and instead of saying no 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 you're you're in yahweh's territory you're going to have to worship my god solomon gives in and so he builds according to the bible uh, three high places temples really to the east of Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. This would be on the Mount of Olives. One is for Chemosh, the national god of Moab, who is uh, identical to Ares, the war god of Greek uh, Greece, uh, Mars, the war god of Rome. Uh, Astarte, who's this ancient Sumerian Inanna Ishtar, gender-fluid goddess of sex and war, who thinks that she's going to run things in the end time. And Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, who is Milcom? You start digging into the uh, scholarly literature and you find that Milcom is just the Ammonite word that means king, sort of like Melech in Hebrew. It's a title. It's not a proper name. Milcom was uh, the name that, or the title that the Ammonites gave to the chief god of the Canaanites or the creator god of the Canaanites, El. El, who is Enlil, who is Saturn, who is Kronos, who is Shemiyaza. That's who was worshipped By the Ammonites, and Solomon built a temple to this entity on the Mount of Olives. Now, interestingly, the Hebrews, as they did with certain other characters, like Baal, they called Bosheth. You changed a couple of the vowels, and uh, you turned the name from Lord to shameful thing. Astarte becomes Ashtoreth, same thing, from Astarte to shameful thing. They did the same thing with Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. That's Molech. Molech, the god who demanded that children be sacrificed and burned in fire. That's who Solomon built a temple for on the Mount of Olives. And because of this, we see in 2 Kings that the, uh, the rabbis, the, uh, the, the priests, began to call it the Mount of Corruption. The Mount of Corruption. Except when you read the Hebrew, once again, that definite article, the, makes things more interesting. Because it's not Har Mashkith, Mount of 
destruction, mount of corruption, whatever. It's har ha, Mosh Keith, mount of the destroyer. That's the hmm. phrase that replied to the angel who was called the destroyer in the time of David. Now, this is not the same destroyer God sent a destroying angel, the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, that's Jesus. That's the pre-incarnate Christ. But you've got this mountain now called, and it's, we're specifically told in the Old Testament, 2 Kings, that it's uh, 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and I've got the verses in the Bible. I don't have them in front of me, sadly, uh, that uh, it's called the Mount of Corruption in English. But because of this high place to the abomination of the Am- Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, um, I... I notice this and I har, hash, wait a minute this this looks like mount of the destroyer but i'm not a hebrew scholar i don't speak or read hebrew so i got in touch with our friend uh rabbi zev porat messianic rabbi and said is is this a reasonable translation of this phrase he said yeah yeah i wonder why i didn't see that before well oh thank you zev i appreciate that um mount of the destroyer then you go to the new testament and read about the last week of jesus life and again, this is the subject of my presentation for the virtual conference for Skywatch TV. It's, uh, and I'm also going to talk about this out in Denver in a few weeks at the Prophecy Watchers Conference, the connection between Mount Hermon, where this rebellion began, led by this entity, Enlil El Shemiyaza, who now the priests in the time of Solomon called, you know, named the mountain for him because he's got a temple up there that Solomon just built, Mount of the Destroyer. I mean, think about it. If you've been to Jerusalem and you've been to the Mount of Olives, you realize the Mount of Olives is higher than the Temple Mount. So when you're there where those temples were for these pagan gods, you're looking down on the temple of God. And not only that, you're you're to the east so that when the temple of Yahweh, the temple of God opens, Solomon's temple, the doors open, the gates open, and you're looking at the Mount of Olives at these pagan temples built by Solomon. What an insult. So in the time of Jesus Christ in the first century... He takes Peter and the disciples to the, uh, to the base of Mount Hermon, Caesarea Philippi, which is where Peter makes that great confession. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this was not revealed to you by any man, but by my father in heaven. And on this rock, he says, I tell you, you are Peter, you are Petros. And on this rock, on this Petra, little wordplay there. Uh, This 9,200-foot mountain we're standing in front of, I will build my church in the gates of hell, which is this really big cave over here that everybody thinks is the entrance to the netherworld, the grotto of Pan. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then the Gospel of Matthew tells us six days later, James, John, Peter accompanied Jesus up a very high mountain, which can only be Mount Hermon because it's the only very high mountain in the vicinity of Caesarea Philippi. And that's where Jesus is transfigured into a being of light. And then Moses and Elijah appear, which is why Sharon and I think they are the two witnesses. Moses and Elijah appear. The three (coughs) disciples freak out. And then Jesus and the disciples come down. He sends out the 70 disciples ahead of him into Galilee, which is uh, basically another insult, another slap in the face of the spirit realm, because the Canaanites believe that El, Enlil, Kronos, Saturn, Mm -hmm. lived on Mount Hermon with his 70 sons, in other words, the gods of the nations, because in the ancient in ancient Mesopotamia, in ancient uh, Israel, the number 70 just just was a, a symbol. It meant all of them. Jesus was saying, my 70, the 70 who are going to spread the gospel to the world are more powerful than your 70. And then he went Amen. to Jerusalem and he spent the last week of his life dividing his time between the Temple Mount, the Har Moed, the Mount of Assembly, and the Mount of Olives, where this entity had had a temple built to look down on the temple of God. Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead on the Mount of Olives. He delivers the sermon, he delivers the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse, where Matthew 24 and 25, the most detailed explanation, the detailed prophecy of what is going to happen in the end times on the Mount of Olives. He's betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. He's crucified on the Mount of Olives. And of course, he's buried there, according to the Gospel of John. There was a tomb in the garden where he was killed and he was buried there on the mount of olives and then he descends into the abyss 
1 Peter 3, beginning in verse 19, he descends into the abyss to proclaim to the spirits. And that word in the Greek translated spirits never refers to human spirits unless it's qualified as such. He was declaring to the spirits who had disobeyed in the days of Noah. The watchers, the sons of God from Genesis 6, Jesus went down there to declare his victory over them. Yeah, you thought I was vulnerable because I was fully human. But watch this. On the third day, I'm getting out. And you're not. (laughs) And so he is resurrected on the Mount of Olives. Of course, he's seen by the two women, then the disciples, the apostles. He continues to teach according to the Gospel of Luke. He's raised up into heaven from Bethany, which is on the Mount of Olives. And according to Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, when he returns, he lands on the Mount of Olives and it splits in half splitting north to south, creating a great chasm, which I believe is the Valley of Jehoshaphat that we read about elsewhere in the Old Testament, which means Valley of Yahweh has judged. And that's Armageddon. It all happens there on the Mount of Olives. And then, of course, that, that Valley of Jehoshaphat leads right to the Eastern Gate where he enters in and establishes his kingdom on earth. That's how important God considers this entity. That's how important this entity is, who's essentially conned humanity into just sort of writing him out of the picture, while at the same time getting occult adepts and astrologers to believe that Saturn is going to return and rule over a new golden age. We see this in the poem written by Virgil around the year 40 B.C. Justice returns, returns old Saturn's reign with a new breed of men sent down from heaven, ruling over a new golden age. That's what the World Economic Forum and their minions think was signified by the great conjunction or the great mutation on the winter solstice, December 21st of 2020. They think this is the new golden age and they're going to launch it. And to them, a golden age means an age where you and me own nothing but we'll be happy. Well, God, make us. Ha- God has a greater reset coming. And that's why Sharon and I do the weekly program, Unraveling Revelation, t- because it's been promised. There will be a great reset. It's just not the one that these guys at the World Economic Forum think. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, every- I don't know if people listening could actually see this. I know, I know they probably are because they're in tune with this stuff. But, you know, you're seeing a repeat of Genesis 6. You really are. And you're seeing this blending. It's like uh, the devil and all his hordes want to blend and reshape humanity into their own image, male and female, into a blended mishmash. You own nothing to be happy about it. And I don't know if you saw this. I could send you the, the link to the 2018 World Economic Forum. Maybe you've seen it, where Noah Hararis was talking about the AI and there'd be this big collective AI, and there's got to perfect it. And that's 2018. Now, that's four years ago. And so you're going to be plugged into the Internet of all things. You'll own nothing. You'll be happy. So you'll sit in your basement. You'll be plugged into your the AI, and you can take a trip to Europe and never leave your little prison, I mean, your little cell. And you'll live in a collective community and an all-inclusive community where it's about, you know, 10 miles around or 10 kilometers around, five kilometers, and you can ride your electric bicycle and you can ride your little scooter and get your groceries. Uh, (laughs) Wow, what a world that I got. Mm -hmm. And you'll be neither male nor female. They're they're working (laughs) on transgender. They're working on uh, transhumanism. And it's like, wow, no wonder Jesus says as it was (laughs) in the days of Noah. As the days a lot too. We're seeing that. Mm-hmm. Amen. We're seeing it. It's just I just shake my head, and that's why I'm looking at all this stuff, and I'm looking at the occult world, and I'm seeing the. I mean, if I can go, and put, what they say on the economic world economic forum, and compare it with the thoughts and some of the lines from Alice Bailey and Foster Bailey and some of the others, there's a connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, again, the, these people are useful idiots because they're not serving entities who have their best interests at heart. No, they want the collective suicide of humanity. It's the only yes. way I can put it. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, but yeah, the, you know, the, yeah, the child sacrifice, all that. I can't really talk about that here, but 
You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, all the stuff they're trying to do is amazing. And I'm just going, wow. And they all started in 2020 with, the, with that conjunction of the new age of Aquarius. Well, they've been working towards this for a very, very long time. It's just uh, they, they seem to think that the time is now, which is why things are ramping up. And I believe that as we see uh, the the fear over the, uh, uh, the, the health crisis ending, I believe that we will see them return to the climate crisis to try to convince us to welcome new global overlords. Yeah, that's the Rockefeller Foundation put out a scenario plan in 2010 that has the plan right there. I'm watching it. So, yeah, climate change is next. And cybercrime is the other thing, a crime, a rise in crime. And to, so everybody will scramble together and make a new world. Hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm just watching this stuff. I can't believe it. It's just, uh, it's, I know. It's, it's, amazing. It's, it's startling. We see the prophecies unfolding in front of our very eyes. And when it, but when it does, we're, we're surprised it, uh, I, I don't think we should be as surprised as, as we are, um, because we know that these prophecies are sure Jesus guaranteed it by prophesying his return on the third day and then making it happen and uh, doing yeah. it in front of witnesses. And that's the thing that really makes this, makes the Christian faith different. He did it in front of witnesses. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were still hundreds of witnesses to the risen, the resurrected Christ walking around 20 years after the resurrection, telling this church in, in what is now Turkey, look, it's all about resurrection. Because if, if he's not resurrected, we're still in our sins. And so if you want to guarantee, if you want to confirm what I'm telling you, send somebody to Jerusalem and ask around because there are still hundreds of witnesses who saw this event. And my dad, who was yeah. in was an engineer and, you know, had a, li a, a very linear engineer's brain. You know, wh how do we solve this problem? What's the straightest line between A and B? And uh, after examining things like Von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods and other alternate theories, you know, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He was revived in the tomb and went off and married Mary Magdalene or whatever, you know, the Dan Brown hypothesis. He finally concluded the most simple, reasonable answer was the one that's in the gospel. The reason the Roman Empire, the Sanhedrin in the first century could not crush this new cult or what they thought was a cult is because there were too many witnesses. Just like Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 15, there were too many people who'd seen what had happened. They'd seen Lazarus raised from the dead. They'd seen Jesus feed thousands of people with a few loaves of bread. They'd seen a dead man walk again. They couldn't, they couldn't stamp that out. Too many people had seen the truth. Yeah, and the first time they did things, they had the rebellion in Genesis chapter 6, and the plan was to get rid of humanity, so God can't fulfill his promise to humanity in Genesis chapter 6 there, where he says, I give you dominion over the earth. And yeah, if they can get rid of have God destroy humanity by making them sin, then God it would be disproved that he's all-powerful and he can't keep his word. He, totally contrary to, to God's nature and character, and they could win. But no, Jesus that came back. He redeemed lost humanity through on the cross, and he gave them a final insult, a big slap in the face. I wouldn't even call it a slap in the face. I call it a, a Mike Tyson knockout punch <laughs> on the Mount Olives. You know, when he <laughs> arose, he says, my people are coming with me. My people are coming with me. Amen. And so, you know, you think you got it? Yeah. Oh, my people are coming with me. <laughs> and um, wow, that's just amazing. You know, I wish so much, Derek. I mean, I, I come to this conclusion that churches, I just wish they would have taught this stuff instead of going into the intellectual aspect of everything. Because, man, I tell you, people would really like this. I, I, well, I can tell you, if, if it, when I was a kid and was really fascinated with uh, superhero stories and uh, even you know Greek mythology, which I thought was really interesting, if I had understood that Greek mythology was a a twisted retelling of actual history and that the real history is in the Bible, and that the well, that's the reason that Sharon and I our, our last collaborative book is called Giants, Gods, and Dragons. It's because the giants, the gods, and the dragons in the Bible are real. And that's who is fighting against us. But as Sharon likes to say, you know, when you read the 23rd Psalm and you realize the shepherd is right behind you, 
with a rod and a staff, and that staff is a cosmic beatdown stick. So Ooh, these, yeah. this enemy that we're facing, hey, look, if you got a problem with me, talk to my shepherd. Yes, yeah, talk to my shepherd. I would have thought church was so much cooler. Oh, yes. yeah. I couldn't have waited to get back there. So, yes, I, 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 I would love to see this. To Sunday school. What, what, what's yes, next? <laughs> exactly. I would love to see this when I was a kid. Love to see this kind of information being taught to, uh, to kids today. I would, too. I, I try my best on my videos to try and get people educated on this and see this mix and where we're headed and also their hope that they have in Jesus Christ, that he rose from the dead, that we can rise, too, with them. <laughs> we get out of here just like it was in the days of Noah. We get lifted up. Mm -hmm. Yep. Amen. Get out of this, the blessed hope. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see. I think we've about run about an hour about right now. So I best, <laughs> I want to keep going. I want to keep going. But, this, <laughs> yeah. but maybe I could just ask one last thing. You know, in the closing chapters of the book, you talk about. A certain building in Washington, D.C. and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you want to just close us out with that? <laughs> well, I, I've done presentations on this that took me an hour and a half to go all the way through, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, make it short. If, if your viewers are familiar at all with Tom Horn's books, um, Abaddon, uh, uh, Apollyon Rising 2012, or Zenith 2016, I essentially build on that. And my contention is that the art... The, the occult symbolism built into the art and architecture of the United States Capitol. And I, I didn't get into the Masonic symbolism of the layout of Washington, D.C. Tom covered that very well. I don't have any uh, anything to add to that. But uh, I think the and the reason that's the reason, by the way, that the United States Capitol is on the cover of the book. Because uh, as as I researched this and, and really dug into it, I realized that there was a, I, I had to get into that. Um, the United States Capitol is called the Capitol. O.L., because that's the name of the Temple of Jupiter in ancient Rome, the Capitolium. Uh, Thomas, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson insisted that the place where Congress met in the, in the new capital when this was being designed, the capital A.L., in uh, 1799, that it be called the Capitol O.L., uh, and he argued, in fact, there are letters in the Library of Congress showing that he had a, a little bit of a dispute with the uh, the architect, uh, uh, Pierre Charles L'Enfant, who wanted to call it Congress House. Jefferson insisted that it be called the Capitolium, um, or the Capitol because of the Capitolium. Now, he's, he's not a Satan worshiper, not a Jupiter worshiper. He just wanted to evoke the image of uh, the Roman Republic, you know, this new Republican experiment that they were trying to uh, create here in the United States. But Inside the Capitol, as it was built and it was decorated over the decades, there were a number of things that were built into it. And Tom went into some of that. Uh, the fact that um, they created a chamber down in the uh, the crypt. There, there's nobody buried in the crypt, but there was a chamber created that was supposed to hold the body of George Washington. And in the rotunda above, there was a hole in the floor so that visitors in the rotunda could look down and see the body of George Washington. Well, the War of 1812 got in the way, and by the time they finally got it rebuilt after the British burned the building, uh, George's descendants said, no, he's going to stay here in Mount Vernon. Thank you very much. Uh, Martha had given her permission to move George's body there, but uh, again, the War of 1812 got in the way. Um, but then, of course, in the 18, around 1860, you have this painting that was created on the inside of the Capitol Dome called the, uh, uh, the Apotheosis of Washington, depicting George Washington as a god. And I argue that he's depicted as this entity, Shemiyaza, Saturn, the uh, the destroyer, which is kind of the point that I, I failed to make when I was talking about the Mount of Olives earlier. Um, the uh, that, That's sort of the, the cherry on the cake of that story there. I got a little distracted by my own uh, emotions. Um, the reason I think the Mount of Destroyer, as the, the priests in the time of Solomon, is important is because this entity, Molech, Milcom, El, Enlil, El, Saturn, Kronos, Shemiyaza, um, that is the title of this entity when he returns in Revelation chapter 9. Abaddon in Hebrew, Apollyon in Greek means destroyer. And I think that's who this entity is, and that's who these, the Freemasons, uh, the Rosicrucians, the other occult adepts, astrologers, they want him to come back to preside over a new golden age. That's who they think is coming, and he is coming back, according to Revelation chapter 9. But when he does, it's not going to be pleasant, because those who are on earth in that time 
And um, I don't even go into the rapture, the timing thereof in this book, because that's really irrelevant. If we are here during that period of time, we will, we will be sealed with the seal of God in our foreheads. So we will not be touched. But those who don't have that seal will be tormented so intensely that they will long for death, but death will flee from them. Which is interesting because death, Thanatos, is the rider on the pale horse. They will be praying for the rider on the pale horse. And he will flee from them. The transhumanists, this fourth industrial revolution of the World Economic Forum, if they get it, it ain't going to work out the way they want it to. But the thing is, the destroyer, Apollyon, Abaddon, Saturn, Enlil, El, Dagon, Molech, Shemi, whatever name he goes by, he gets five months. Five months, according to Revelation chapter 9, which matches exactly the length of time that the floodwaters during Noah's flood were on the earth. The floodwaters that killed the children that he and his colleagues created, that they were helpless to save while they were chained in the abyss, according to Peter and Jude, chained in gloomy darkness until the judgment. Five months, 150 days, you can look it up. Genesis chapter 8, Genesis chapter 9. That's how long the floodwaters were. We're on the earth, and they will get exactly that amount of time, 150 days, five months in a lunar calendar. They'll get five months at the end to torment those without the seal of God in their foreheads. That's who we're dealing with here. That is the story that is embedded in the occult symbolism in the United States Capitol. The the return of Apollyon, the return of Abaddon, the return or the second coming, if you will, of Saturn. Yeah, that that fits one last thing, kind of how I began. I was kind of leading up to this point. They're they're actually looking for this age, this savior, this person, this entity that's coming back. And it's right there in the constellation of Draco in the occult world. And you mentioned it in the capital. All that stuff is up there, too. And that's what it's all symbolizing is this mm-hmm. entity. We could call him the Antichrist. And that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. yeah, well, you're right. But again... As uh, Jesus um, symbolized when he sent out the 70 disciples ahead of him into Galilee, Christ's 70 are more powerful than Satan's 70. Amen. Amen. Well, with that, I'm so glad you joined us today, Derek. I can continue on and on and on about this. But y'all listening here, if you haven't got the book, The Second Coming of Saturn, I recommend you all get it. I'll put the links up there as well as some of the other books that Derek and Sharon have written. And so glad to have you on here. This has been an honor and a privilege. Boy, this is my cup of tea. This is what I like to talk about. (laughs) And and I don't know, you know, here I am. My wife's going to sleep sometimes, and I'm down here reading academia, all the stuff. (laughs) Oh, God. I mean, what what can I say? Yeah. No, you and me both, brother. (laughs) Anyway, any last words, Derek? Would you like to close with a word of prayer and then... Any announcements like, a, you know, we pretty much know how to contact you, but if any contact information or whatever, just sure. go ahead and let them know. Father, thank you for bringing us together through this uh, virtual medium. And we just pray, Lord, for wisdom and discernment to see and recognize the, uh, the workings of the enemy around us. As Paul wrote, we are not ignorant of the enemy's devices. So help us, Lord, to see with discernment and to share the hope that we have in Christ with gentleness and respect with those around us, our family members, our colleagues, our co-workers. There are so many in this world, Lord, who are, who are blind to what's happening. They don't understand why they are hurting, why they are wounded on the, in this battle. They don't understand that they're in the middle of a battlefield. So, Lord, help us to share that information with them, but to do it lovingly so that we don't, don't make ourselves a, a stumbling block between them and your, your saving grace. Father, we pray for your blessing. We pray for those in parts of the world where your gospel is dangerous. We pray for the church in China. We pray for those in the Middle East, witnessing especially to those of the Muslim faith. Lord, we, we know that the time is growing short, so Lord, just fill us with desire to, to share this, this blessed hope with those around us and to do it every day until our race is run or until you come. And we pray, Father, that you, you come quickly. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Your contact information, of course, is Skywatch TV. Any other 
Any way anybody can contact you? Well, yeah, or? you can uh, you can reach us at uh, gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. Sharon and I um, produce a weekly Bible study there. It's uh, podcast form, so it's audio only, but that's also sort of the uh, uh, growing into a, a web hub for uh, all that we do on uh, on the web. We are uh, producing now our weekly video programs uh, under our own banner, Gilbert House Ministries. So Unraveling Revelation and Sci Friday are going out there. Uh, we've got a new mobile app and uh, will soon be available on, uh, it's also available on Apple TV, but will be available for Roku as well. And you can find a link to that at uh, gilberthouse.org. I'm still with Skywatch TV, still be doing uh, 5 and 10, the daily news commentary there and uh, sitting in on the panels from time to time. But uh, uh, a lot of our efforts will be on the, and this is with the blessing of Joe and Tom Horn, um, basically saying, look, um, <laughs> you guys are doing a lot of this stuff on your own already. Just here, go do this on your own. Just come into the office in the mornings, go do that in the afternoons. So uh, between Skywatch TV, but uh, also gilberthouse.org. In fact, you can reach me uh, by email at Derek at gilberthouse.org. All right. Amen. I'll put all that information on the screen for you folks with that. It's a pleasure talking to you, Derek, and I hope to speak to you again soon. We will. God God bless bless you. you.